in the year 2015 and uh, india started its national action plan for amr in 2017 this is a very important plan and uh, the objectives include improving awareness on antimicrobial resistance enhancing the surveillance activities strengthening infection control and preventive measures research and development in the field of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance promoting investment on research and development and also a better infrastructure for uh, facilitating research and activities but there are so many issues so many issues in the field of antimicrobial resistance like antibiotic overuse in the community antibiotic overuse in the veterinary practice inappropriate selection of antibiotics lack of diagnostic facilities in the field and environmental contamination and overall difficulties with enforcing the regulations uh, in place actually a strong political will and infrastructure and intersectoral coordination between public and private sector and a comprehensive strengthening of healthcare system is essential to prevent to tackle this problem of antimicrobial resistance indian academy of pediatrics started involving in this area in the year 2014 with a ciap action plan on rational antibiotic therapy when dr vijay wale was the president and actually this was followed last year by doctor uh, during the tenure of dr santosh sovens and bakul parekh as well and uh, actually indian academy of pediatrics kerala wanted to have this as an important action plan during dr narayanan's tenure and dr shivaprasad was a state coordinator and we are continuing this program this year also as an important action plan and we want to concentrate on rational antibiotic therapy in office practice which is an important area in general practice and our important uh, activities we plan is awareness programs and some protocols in common office practice problems regarding antibiotic usage as well as we intend to continue the activity of dr narayanan which he had started on preparing an antibiogram for common infections in the community like urinary tract infections as well as neonatal septicemia these are our plans for this year and i hope uh, uh, with uh, dr shiva prasad at the helm of affairs who is the national the state coordinator of kerala government the nodal person for antimicrobial resistance in uh, government program in kerala as the state coordinator for iap action plan also so we have to we plan to proceed in the direction this year also to continue the action plan which was in force last year and i am very happy that iap kochin has taken the lead in launching this action plan for this year with shiva prasad as the state coordinator and i thank dr pramod warrior dr jeeson and dr narayanan who helped uh, who was instrumental in launching this program today and also to all members and all stalwarts of iap kochin for uh, this uh, arranging this uh, platform for the state branch to launch this important action plan and i wish the and we have this very important cme on community acquired pneumonia today with eminent speakers in uh, jagdish chinappa and anup and uh, dr shikanda and i hope this program will be a very important academic program in the launch of this action plan and thank you all once again and i wish the very best for this program and action plan thank you so much uh, thank you dr jayaraman next i invite uh, dr shiv prasad chairperson of the program to for felicitation uh respected senior members dear friends as jeram sir told earlier antimicrobial resistance is a slow pandemic lurking behind covid 19 and we need to discuss it is a platform where politicians are there policy makers are there bureaucrats academicians 
environmental specialist, pollution control board members, because we need to discuss it in a platform, in a wider platform. That needs the one health approach to the AMR. And our series of webinar on this antimicrobial resistance will definitely empower our clinicians in rational antibody therapy, I, I strongly believe. I wish all the success to our initiative, to this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shuprasad. Next, I invite Dr. Johnny Sebastian, Secretary, IAP Kerala State, to offer his felicitations. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Respected President, Dr. Pramod, Secretary, Dr. Sajid, President, IAP Kerala, Jairaman, sir, IPP Narayan, sir, scientific chairperson, Jason, sir, esteemed speakers of the day, senior leaders in IAP, and my dear friends. At the outset, let me congratulate IAP Cochin for organizing the CME today, along with the launch of yet another important presidential action plan on rational antibiotic practice in, in the office practice. We have a very apt topic for the CME also today, antibiotics in community acquired pneumonia from the experts in the field. I wish this CME all success. Jai Hind, Jai Thank you, Dr. Johnny Sebastian. Now I invite uh, Dr. Sajid, our Secretary IAP Coaching Branch, to offer the word of thanks. Uh, good evening, all. I am not taking much time, my responsibility to, to deliver the word of thanks. Um, my sincere thanks to IAP State President Dr. T.P. Jairam, sir, and uh, IAP State Secretary Tony Sebastian, sir, and uh, our own member, Dr. Shiva Prasad, he is the AMR State Nodal Officer from the government side and the state coordinator from the IAP side. My sincere thanks to Dr. Jisanuni, sir, our president, uh, IAP coaching, uh, Dr. Pramod Vaidir, and the eminent speakers, all for the uh, today's presence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes the uh, inaugural function. Next, we quickly move on to the scientific session and I invite uh, Dr. G. Sanunni, Chair of uh, Chair, uh, IAP Scientific Session, to conduct the proceedings. Over to you, sir. Good evening, everybody. It's a uh, great honor to be inaugurating the uh, Antibiotic Awareness Program through the uh, this program of the of computer quiet pneumonia, the Indian the Indian Pitet Scala State Branch Action Plan. Uh, is my slide visible? No, sir. No. So, uh, as you all know, the the or pediatric porphyry. Is now coming up? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pediatric potpourri is something which we have been doing for the last uh, so many months. This uh, time we're doing antibiotics in community quite pneumonia, which is a very, very common problem with all pediatricians at the counter. And something that everybody may be knowing a lot about. But still, there is uh, some areas which need emphasis. The approach is very important and the the new classification of community acquired pneumonia uh, of WHO is something that we need to know about. And uh, we have a galaxy of speakers who are experts in this field. We have a pulmonologist, Dr. Srikanta, who's going to present the case and discuss. Dr. Jagdish Chinnappa, who is a senior pediatrician from Bangalore uh, and uh, a doyen in the, in the area of uh, respiratory medicine. And uh, Dr. Anupwadi, who is an infectious disease consultant. We have a good faculty for this program, and this is the 25th pediatric hot period that we are, start, we are conducting. And uh, we're starting this session as we will go system wise. You know, we're we planning to do a few sessions on antimicrobial awareness as part of Dr. C. P. Teram's action plan uh, of antibiotic uh, awareness program. First of the block is this respiratory system, and we have this case based discussion. The first, uh, uh, we will have a case discussion by Tanta, the journey of community acquired pneumonia. Dr. Srikanta is uh, done as MBBS uh, at DCH and DNB Pediatrics. He's a 
clinical fellow in pediatric pulmonology and sleep medicine from Singapore under Dr. Mahesh Babu. Intervention bronchoscopy is something he's done, and he's one of the few uh, pediatric pulmonologists who does EBUS. He did that at the Ancona Italy Apollo Specialty Hospital in Bangalore, and he's working at Apollo Specialty Hospital in Bangalore. And his current position is consultant intervention for pulmonary, pediatric pulmonologist in sleep medicine, consultant in Astrid CMI and RV Hospital in Bangalore, and he visits Astrid Med City once um, a month. He is got a lot of publications to his credit, and he's a young pulmonologist who is of, of coming up and is very, very reputed in Bangalore. So we will start this session with his case presentation. Over to you, Santa, for your presentation. Thank you for the kind of Without taking much of time. Uh, so we have a one-year, one-year, eight-month-old toddler referred to us with complaints of fever of four days, cough for four days, hurried breathing for two days. On a general examination, uh, child was febrile, respiratory rate was 45 per minute, saturations were 95% in room air with no uh, significant uh, retractions. Uh, on systemic examination, there was reduced air entry in the right infraclavicular area. So looking at this and uh, looking at the clinical picture, even though there is not much of significant retractions, there is a hurried breathing in this particular child. And uh, child also has uh, reduced air entry in the right infraclavicular area. So this is good enough for us to uh, uh, tell that this is a child who has a right upper lobe pneumonia. Uh, before he was referred to us, he underwent blood investigations and chest X-ray in his hometown. And in the same hometown, he was started on IV septraxone and dummy casin. And uh, you can see on the, uh, on the right side, the, his total count was 20,000. Differential count was uh, neutrophilic uh, leukocytosis with uh, neutrophils of 80%. Platelets were 4 lakhs. His renal functions, uh, urea and creatinine were normal and sodium was also normal. And CRP, rather than 1,012, it is 112. And chest X-ray, you can see there is a significant uh, right upper lobe uh, uh, consolidation, which is uh, restricted by your fissure line. So this is a very classical case of uh, right upper lobe consolidation. So on day four that he came to us, he was already on IV antibiotics. So uh, these will be discussed in uh, uh, further discussions. On presentation to our ER, his general physical exa examination, height and weight were appropriate for his age. Uh, he was febrile, 103 degree Fahrenheit. Heart rate was 160 to 170 per minute. Respiratory rate was 66 per minute. SpO2, 88% in room air. All peripheral pulses were well felt. Systemic examination, significant. Now, from what he had presented pre previously to, uh, uh, he had worsened and he had significant intercostal and subcostal interaction. Reduced air entry in right supra, infraclavicular and suprascapular areas. And now, his investigations, his uh, total count had worsened to 36,000 differential. So basically, uh, uh, one slide back, sir. So what we can see from the previous slide to this slide is, before he was referred, he just had a pneumonia. He had uh, uh, saturations which were normal. He had only hurried breathing with uh, uh, bronchial, uh, bronchial breath sounds in the right infraclavicular area. Here, He's presented to us to our emergency room rather than not only having a uh, hypoxemia, which is 88% in room air, he's tachycardic, he's tachypneic, he has significant intercostal and subcostal attractions, also has reduced air entry in right supra infra infraclavicular areas and suprascapular areas. So basically what has happened is within the four days, he has progressed to not only having a community acquired pneumonia, which is just involving the right upper lobe, is going into more or less a complication. So from basic investigation of uh, CBC being a, a total count of 20,000, it has increased to 30,000. Differential count has become even more uh, neutrophilic. Platelet count is slightly on the higher side. RP2, urea, and serum creatinine are more or less normal. There is no significant hyponatremia in this particular child. And most important striking feature is his CRP has worsened from 112 to 300. At this time, we did a blood culture sensitivity and we also did a chest X-ray. So what we can see here is there is a, a significant haziness on the right side, specifically in the right upper lobe. 
there is a light haziness even in the right lower part but uh, uh, more or less the right cardiac shadow is reasonably spared and uh, right cardiophrenic and costophrenic angles are also reasonably spared and uh, with this chest x ray we knew that we have we were dealing here with a complicated severe complicated community acquired pneumonia uh, with a uh, pleural effusion so we also had to know is this a pleural effusion uh, just exudative pleural effusion or this child has gone into empyema because the progression is really fast and with the progression being so fast child also has deteriorated significantly clinically so saturation from 95 to 88 significant respiratory distress as well as significant reduced air entry so we also did an ultrasound thorax and ultrasound thorax showed significant amount of uh, empyematous so what we can see here is a significant amount of loculations with consolidation of the underlying lung so with this we came to a diagnosis of very severe complicated community acquired pneumonia with empyema right so uh, a little bit more into history, no previous history of hospitalizations, no history of recurrent respiratory infections, not vaccinated with uh, the PCV. This was a very, very important point that uh, we were able to emphasize from the patient. Uh, birth history was born term LSCS, birth weight was three kilos, more or less a normal uh, delivery. Uh, postnatal one day stay in NICU for neonatal hyperbilirubinemia, received phototherapy, otherwise not significant uh, birth history as well as the uh, past history. Family history, three siblings, all healthy, no significant past history. So I think uh, by this, uh, what, we are, what we are dealing here with uh, a community acquired pneumonia, which was uh, uh, more or less uh, a simple pneumonia or a uh, 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 non-severe pneumonia went on to become a severe complicated pneumonia a matter of four weeks and the other thing that i want to emphasize here is before referral the child was already on oral uh, see, iv septraxone and iv amikacin and when he was referred to us he already had empyema which was a significant complication of a community acquired pneumonia Thank you, Dr. Sekanda, for that lovely presentation. We now invite Dr. Takish Napar to discuss the approach to a case of company called pneumonia in Indian context. Dr. Chinapa is somebody that we all know. He is the cluster head of pediatrics Manipal Hospital in Bangalore region. He was the president of the IEP respiratory chapter 2019-2020. Very modest uh, uh, person, so he's not given his full bio data. But he's somebody who is a very uh, astute clinician and he's uh, going to deal to tell us the approach to community acquired pneumonia. Over to you, Jagdish. Thank you, Dr. Jason. And I congratulate uh, Kochi branch of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics for bringing the antimicrobial stewardship into the public domain. Because I think it's high time that we partner with all stakeholders to see that less and less of antibiotics are used unnecessarily. The first thing I would do in any child who comes to me with a fever, cough and cold is to protect yourself with contact and droplet precautions. Having said that, I congratulate also Dr. Srikanta for his beautiful presentation of the progress of community acquired pneumonia. Let us now ask is the, what is the definition of pneumonia? And I can tell you this, that there was a committee which met a couple of years back trying to find out is there a standard definition of pneumonia. Unfortunately, there isn't. So it goes by a constellation of clinical signs and symptoms, which we understand in our cognition as pneumonia. But as such, if you go to see, technically, there is no clear cut definition of pneumonia. And that's the reason why if you look at all the studies, there is so much of dichotomy in various parameters, various uh, interventions, if what one cause calls Valry with tachypnea, fever, cough is also called pneumonia in some situations. Somebody else calls something else pneumonia. So what is pneumonia itself is a problem. But for today's evening, we understand that pneumonia means of an acute onset of an infectious condition which produces a congestion and a consolidation in the lung either a part of the lung or a whole lobe of the lung and it's a predominant clinical diagnosis the first issue that we need to understand is it viral bacterial or both now dr shrikanta's case if it had come on day one day three day five or day seven would mean different things to us in clinical practice if the child came to me with a running nose, fever, 
cough and a tachypnea on day one i would think more often like of a viral infection especially if multiple mucosal membranes are involved like the eyes nose throat cough and i don't find clear cut evidence of consolidation so therefore please understand that children's respiratory rate can go up not only with bacterial pneumonias but with viral pneumonias can go up with wheezing disorders can go up with, even with fever and if with if there's a cardiac problem or acidosis so there are multiple areas where the uh, respiratory rate can go up so it's very important for the clinician to suspect a bacterial pneumonia in a community of course the government to take um, you know uh, cognizance of this any small infant less than 5 years who comes to you with fever cough and tachypnea is administered an antibiotic very often we start off with a viral infection day 3 day 5 day 7 it could go into a bacterial infection if you looked at the majority of deaths which happened after the influenza pandemic they were all probably related to invasive pneumococcal disease so therefore not easy to distinguish between viral bacterial or both it's the astute clinician and a good follow up which will help you distinguish between the two the other thing which we also come up with is atypical organisms when do we look at atypical organisms well if it is bacterial most of the time it's the triumvirate of three things that we look at most of the time it is streptococcus pneumonia it could be staphylococcus or occasionally moraxella catarrhalis non typical h influenza which could produce the pneumonia atypical organisms are not uncommon and diagnosing them is not very easy they could present exactly like any other bacterial infection however they are seen in slightly older children they are seen beyond the age of 3 years very often they come insidious cough is a predominant feature extra pulmonary things like rashes arthritis Uh, meningitis etc could be associated with mycoplasma pneumonia it's again the progress which is important other thing which you can get in uh, a mycoplasma is very often bilateral hyperinflation with uh, with ronchi so therefore not easy but atypical organisms should be suspected in those conditions where it is again dr shrikanta mentioned presented this case it's very important to know how severe a, a, a pneumonia is the who has revised its classification now into pneumonia and very similar to severe pneumonia any child who comes to you with grunting retractions and significant tachypnea does not feed well looking sick does not sleep well these are the children you need to suspect and if you find by doing a simple pulse oximetry that it is less it's dropping less than 92 then definitely it's a severe pneumonia because it is now affecting gas exchange and you will land up in respiratory failure shortly so i think the important thing is to look at the child very carefully clinically and assess the respiratory rate assess retractions assess grunting assess the overall feeding of the child assess the distress of the child and i'm sure a clinician can very easily make out whether this is severe or not strider or rals pneumonia well you can get it's not uncommon that you will get wet sounds because pneumonia goes through the various pathogenic mechanisms it can go into congestion repetition red repetition and resolution so in each progression of these diseases you can get various kinds of wet sounds you can get bronchial breathing you can get crepitations so that alone doesn't mean anything so if you find rals doesn't mean that there's no pneumonia so uh, strider uncommon should i use a pulse oximeter yes a pulse oximeter is mandatory not only for covid but any form of lung involvement because it tells you very easily how good the gas exchange is and how severe it is it also when should i admit any child who's got a problem feeding is should be admitted any child who's got a very severe pneumonia should be admitted any child who's got hypoxemia should be admitted and another very important thing any child whom you cannot follow up or who's go, who will not follow up for various reasons sometimes patients come from let's say far distance away and these patients should be admitted for observation because the progression as in shrikant dr shrikanta's case can be pretty rapid so therefore admission may be necessary here should i investigate most community acquired pneumonias may need no investigations however most of the time we'll end up doing all these investigations as in dr shrikanta's case a blood count will do a crp please remember that a blood count a crp 
a procalcitonin a biofire a blood calcer are not mandatory these are mandatory only in situations where you have a worsening of the disease after 48 hour follow up after you diagnose a case of community acquired pneumonia on day 1 uh, that is not a non that is a non severe pneumonia and you start treatment and you follow up and this patient does not improve that's the time you investigate with all the things that are put on this slide even an x ray is not required for a routine pneumonia it's only the patient who does not respond to treatment or worsens on on treatment in the next 48 hours that needs all these investig investigations to help you out to the next slide please treatment i think we are going to go into um, this a little more in detail it's very important to administer antimicrobials early when you are suspecting pneumonia if you are suspecting influenza and it is the season of influenza then oseltamivir is a good choice all patients who are hypoxic will need oxygen fluid management in pneumonia is an art and one must see that you neither under hydrate this patient or over hydrate it's very easy to over hydrate because many of these patients may have sidh and it's very easy to produce pulmonary edema after giving excessive fluids antipyretics of course we would give but again important point here do not give medic medication too aggressively bronchodilators is being are administered for the wet sounds that you hear if after the first dose of bronchodilator there's no use please don't use and the last one should never be used in a pneumonia because a cough syrup is of no use a patient who comes to you with pneumonia should be always followed up 48 hour follow up or earlier if the patient is worsening should be seen another caveat here please follow up is for the routine patient who is between 6 months to 5 years in a patient who is less than 6 months admission is mandatory please do not try to follow these children on an opd basis so i think these are the few things that we will look at thank you dr jagdish for that excellent liberation approach to cap we will now hear from the infectious disease specialist and none other than dr anup varier on rational antibiotics in company acquired pneumonia so dr anup varier is a lead consultant in infectious disease and infectious control asters em healthcare india units he is in charge of all the aster units in india he's done his dnb general medicine apar cpfi dsa is board certified in infectious infection control certified in travel health and adult vaccinations certified in antimicrobial stewardship from the university of Rad radford university netherlands who and bsa the programs he certified in the healthcare quality and management from i am uh and uh, is an uh, there's an executive program and he's a focus areas are antimicrobial stewardship hospital acquired infections both you anup for your presentation thank you dr jason and uh, good evening all so next 5 to 10 minutes i'll guide you through what are the uh, concepts and basic principles of using antimicrobials in the uh, pneumonia in the child so the initial statement would uh, it would seem a little obvious like why and when do we use antimicrobials the reason i am putting this up across is often we forget this basic concept that antibiotics only inhibit replication of the microbe within the host when it is a infectious syndrome and we try to attack or we try to manage fevers and surgical complications extended complications of in this case empyema etc with escalation and change of antimicrobials where that is not appropriate so an appropriate use of antibiotics would be to identify which conditions do not respond to antibiotics and withhold antibiotics at that point so that's the starting or stepping stone to good stewardship next is that once we understand that our purpose is to block the replication of a microbe based on the infectious syndrome we need to look at what are the pathogens which we would expect in that particular clinical syndrome because our antibiotics are targeted at that particular group so in the children we have an age based difference between the common pathogens while streptococcus pneumonia figures the top throughout at all age group which includes even adults and elderly we have certain other bacteria like atypicals what dr jagdish mentioned as mycoplasma which comes up in the older children while very very uncommon or less common in the younger group there are also few or minor differences between the western data and indian data on the right side you see a table which compares the group or the etiology 
in the uk visa vis india and nigeria so three areas with so different kinds of uh, pathogens based on the geography so we should also understand that geography has a relevance age has a relevance next slide there could also be certain unusual pathogens and again dr jagdish has specifically mentioned this where we think of this in complicated communicable pneumonia in our subcontinent we have unusual bugs like burkholderia pseudomoly causing miliidosis though in children mostly it is skin and soft tissue pneumonia is also possible that has been reported macrolide resistant mycoplasma pneumonia is something which is coming up as a problematic pathogen not responding to azithromycin tb we can never forget in our scenario when somebody doesn't respond as easily to a communicable pneumonia as we should and we also have invasive klebsiella disease coming up in a subset of patients which go on for complications now if i need to give up three steps in selecting and choosing an appropriate drug so the first message would be to focus on key pathogens and we have seen the list based on the age and geography that what are the key pathogens so this decides our empiric therapy at the instant itself we need to review the risk factors for unusual pathogens this could be an exposure to tuberculosis at home Uh, it may be an, something suggestive of a primary immunodeficiency, which would make you think of unusual pathogens like staph and um, Burkholderia, etc. We should monitor closely for clinical improvement. And again, Dr. Jayadesh has highlighted this multiple times: the need of follow-up at 48 hours, so that after this you can actually consider advanced diagnostics, both to confirm your diagnosis and to identify complications. So, in a nutshell, if I want to put up the treatment summary in a single slide. the op treatment the start with op treatment first line is plain amoxicillin the guidelines do recommend amoxiclav and cefpodoxime as second line we will be discussing these in detail in the coming slides however please note that amox remains first line none of the guidelines recommend routine addition of macrolide neither for i op nor ip the dosing of amoxicillin there are two regimens there is a standard dosing of 45 mg per kg per day to a higher dose of 90 mg again we will be discussing this in detail in the coming slides the duration for an uncomplicated pneumonia there are studies and good sort of evidence to back a short duration in somebody who has got a rapid response who becomes febrile and is all right by 72 to 48 to 72 hours duration of 5 days could be enough for an ip treatment the who regimen suggests starting with ampicillin and genta the second lines being ceftriaxone and again amoxiclav an mrsa cover should be considered specifically in staph syndromes and there is a specific clinical presentation of the staph pneumonia in terms of bilateral bronco pneumonia or a necrotizing pneumonia where you would require linozolid which is the first line in this guideline or an option of vanco plus clinda again the choice of these antibiotics i'll discuss in the coming slides in ip also they insist no routine macrolides the standard duration could be anywhere between 5 days for a rapidly improving child to max 10 days rarely for complicated mrsa we need to prolong it for 2 to 3 days so this publication in 2018 this is a who evidence review and i just want to highlight three points from this evidence review published one is that oral amoxicillin was as effective as parenteral drugs even in severe cap when the child was well enough to feed the second they reiterated based on rcts that there is no benefit for routine addition of macrolides nor addition of quinolones and third point they again underline the fact that there is no benefit from routine high dose amoxicillin so three major points from this who evidence review why is this so we'll have a brief look at the background for these recommendations so let us start from the reason why high dose amoxicillin was concerned that was to address or target penicillin resistance so this systematic review published about 3 4 years ago suggests that at that time penicillin resistance was just around 10% so penicillin resistant is not a huge problem as of now in india next slide if at all we need to identify penicillin resistant the message is we would need measurement of mics on minimal inhibitory concentrations we need automated systems or e scripts to do that we can't make that comment based on disk diffusion reliably the reason being for community acquired pneumonia the syndrome we were discussing the mics to report or consider resistance are high 
we consider resistance only if the mic is more than 8 and then go on to alternatives like vanco or linozolin while if it is meningitis for the same bug that is pneumo streptococcus pneumoniae the mic required to look at resistance is just 0.1 or 0.5 and more will become grossly resistant again to reiterate low rates of penicillin resistant strep pneumonia and no evidence of clinical benefit with empiric treatment for prs in cap setting in india specifically on based on the who guidelines the other point is that now you go through the pain of actually culturing and looking at the drug susceptibility you do an automated drug susceptibility you identify the mic and you label that this infection is a penicillin resistant strep pneumonia does this mean clinical failure now a lot of prospective data descriptive studies they conclude that in terms of outcome of a community acquired pneumonia and this is true even for adults that it is the severity at presentation which relates to the outcome rather than the resistance of the pneumonia strain and why is that this is because the antibiotic concentrations achieved by amoxicillin in the lung are about 100 times that can be reached in the brain and our standard dosing delivers a high level sufficient to overcome the pneumococcal mics even with sort of intermediate and resistant strains for the time period of 40 to 50% of the dosing interval which is all that is required now is amoxicillin clavulinate better than amoxicillin alone three points to be noted one penicillin resistance is due to an altered penicillin binding protein not enzyme mediated clavulinate is an enzyme inhibitor and therefore addition of an enzyme inhibitor will not help to overcome the resistance of prsp next now for the other common pathogen that is staph aureus it could be methicillin sensitive or methicillin resistant please don't go by the name methicillin with associated with it you need to look at cefoxitin susceptibility which is the most reliable marker of mssa or mrsa so if cefoxitin is sensitive it is mssa if cefoxitin is resistant it is mrsa so when you get a culture report look at cefoxitin susceptibility and make your judgment necrotizing pneumonias are associated with toxin production due to a gene called pvl hence you need to add a drug that inhibits toxin production due to its anti ribosome activity hence the addition of clindamycin if you are using vancomycin or linozolid as a single drug because linozolid is a protein synthesis inhibitor for mssa your core antibiotic would be tloxacillin or cefazolin and for mrsa your core antibiotic would be a glycopeptide that is vancomycin or ticoplan if your lab is reporting susceptibilities by disc diffusion and in your disc diffusion if erythromycin has been reported as resistant please do not straight away believe the clindamycin susceptibility report if erythromycin is resistant review clindamycin by looking at what is called as d test so for a disc diffusion if the erythromycin and clindamycin disc are put close together the gene called lrm gene in the erith which causes erythromycin resistance it induces or stimulates the bug to produce inhibitors or produce resistance to clinda hence when you put this do close together what you see on the far right corner the disc the susceptibility margin of the clinda will be cut causing this what is called as the d test what you see on the far right so if the d test is positive do not use clinda because erythromycin resistance has induced clindamycin susceptibility that is the point in this now mycoplasma is suspected in specific groups like older age prolonged prodromal symptoms extra pulmonary features and low inflammatory markers like wbc and crp next slide the re key reason for suspecting my mycoplasma that is that we need to send a serology here or sometimes a pcr can be done people who don't or patients or children who don't respond to azithromycin within first 2 to 3 days and a mycoplasma pneumonia is clinically suspected based on the other features we need to escalate or revise to either doxycycline or cipro which are the two recommended second line drugs for macroloid resistant mycoplasma further escalation worsening is immunomodulators in terms of methylprednisone and ivig which i will not discuss there so just the point that 
माइक्रोड रेसिस्टेंस सेकंड लाइन इज डॉक्सी और सिप्रो थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच डॉक्टर अनुप वारी इट वाज एन एक्सेलेंट प्रेजेंटेशन आई नो इन माइक्रोड सेकंड टू टेल वन व्हाट एल्स नीड्स टू बी कंसीडर्ड इन ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ कम्युनिकेटिव न्यूमोनिया इन चिल्ड्रन थैंक यू सर सो बेसिकली व्हाट वी हैव जस्ट Uh, gone through is how do we diagnose a pneumonia? Do we really require all the investigations at our disposable to actually diagnose a, a non-severe community acquired pneumonia? To how do we diagnose a severe uh, community acquired pneumonia which is fastly progressing? And what are the antibiotics that are supposed to be used? And what are the antibiotics that are not supposed to be used? So apart from antibiotics, we also have some general management measures, and these are very very important. And these are as important as we use our IV antibiotics or oral antibiotics. So management of fever. I'm not going to go to the pharmacological uh, uh, the uh, pharmacological medication. So this is basically a non-pharmacological uh, measure that we will be putting forward. So in management of fever, apart from your uh, uh, the the uh, the paracetamols, uh, we also. ask a lot of times we have heard patients being advised tepid sponging patients being to told to completely wipe them uh, with a with a lukewarm water so basically all the management protocols say there is no role of uh, tepid sponging and we have been taught from our post graduation days that tepid sponging actually increases the irritability of the child rather than actually doing good to the child and tepid sponging in lot of randomized control trials have shown to have nothing significant improvement in their fevers apart from that preventing dehydration identify identifying signs of deterioration particularly in this particular child the referring doctor was not only able to identify the clinical deterioration in terms of saturations in terms of respiratory distress but also he was able to identify that the breath sounds were reducing and this is beyond the scope to be handled in a, a pub, the public sector or public setting how to access further healthcare that is very very important uh, providing a safety net the safety net should be one or more of the following that is provide the parent or carer with verbal or written information on warning symptoms and how further healthcare can be accessed a very 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 important thing a child who you send back into community with a non severe pneumonia and oral amoxicillin please also give them a written form saying that these are the signs that you need to look for please teach the parents they are very astute in knowing what they have to look for in their children please ask them to count respiratory rate for one whole minute and they will do it and because the child is very comfortable in parents arms or parents uh, laps they will be able to do it quite reasonably well apart from that now anybody and everybody at least in bangalore or even in kochi has a pulse oximeter in their house just plug on the pulse oximeter and see for oxygen saturations apart from that see for any retractions arrange to for arrange a follow up appointment at a certain time and place liaise with other healthcare professionals including out of our providers to ensure parent or carer has direct access to further assessment particularly now that we are in a meeting now and if there is a child who has severe community acquired pneumonia comes to emergency room they know need to know which emergency room to go to where is the emergency room where is the pediatric emergency room that they have to go to any doctor they think that they can meet all this if they are uh, kind of told about it goes it goes a little bit more beyond just uh, caring for the children apart from that we have other non pharmacological uh, uh, ways of managing community acquired pneumonia first is oxygen therapy the second is fluid therapy chest physiotherapy ventilatory support surgery so i'm going to tease out every point so oxygen therapy hypoxic infants and children may not appear cyanosed so first thing that either uh, the doctors or uh, the parents think that the child is not blue so should i really be worried no agitation may be an indicator of hypoxia any child who is agitated or is getting agitated you have to start looking at worsening of the pneumonia and patients whose oxygen saturation is less than 92 while breathing uh breathing air room air should be treated with oxygen and what are the modes of oxygen delivery we have our head box in infants uh, less than 3 months face mask we have nasal cannulas including hhfncs others we also use venturi masks so all are there at our disposal to deliver so apart from that we also take care of fluid therapy children who are unable to maintain their fluids the intake due to breathlessness or fatigue need fluid therapy so some children have early onset of pneumonia where they have persistent cough and they just keep throwing up and they need fluid therapy 
uh, or some children are not at all able to take some uh, take any amount of fluid because of respiratory distress because of the tiredness because of whatever reason it is so they have to be instituted fluid therapy methods employed in our in fluid therapy is oral definitely sips of water if the child is able to take a few uh, uh, a few sips of water or even a little reasonable amount of oral feeds i think that is reasonably good nasogastric tube feeding is another way of uh, uh, doing this and intravenous fluids are again something that is being done day in and day out fluid therapy nasogastric tube may compromise breathing and should therefore be avoided in severely ill children and especially in infants with small nasal passages so especially say you have a 3 month old infant or a 6 month old infant who has a nasal a very small, small nasal passage putting a nasogastric tube is going to compromise the breathing so be very careful with that if you if use cannot be avoided the smallest tube should be passed down the smallest nostril so you know when you pass an ng tube you can decide which is the smallest one and depending on that pass the smallest so imagine you have a 3 month old size what is the smallest size you get you get a four french you can just put in a four french if you really have to do that pa patients who are vomiting or who are severely ill may require intravenous fluids and electrolyte monitoring plasma sodium potassium urea and or creatinine should be measured at baseline and at least daily uh, and we already know that children who have pneumonias can also develop Uh, uh hyponatremia they have dilutional hyponatremia as well as syndrome of inappropriate adh secretion so they have to be monitored appropriately and sodium instituted appropriately apart from that should we do chest physiotherapy this is the commonest prescription i see in most of the hospitals physiotherapy did not have any effect on length of stay fever or chest radiographic findings in patients with pneumonia no matter what stage of pneumonia you are dealing with early Uh, 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 so, a uh, stage of consolidation. So, so to the stage of resolution. When the stage of resolution happens, child starts having cough, a little bit of wet cough. Even in that situation, physiotherapy has not shown to have any beneficial effect. There is no evidence to show that physiotherapy is beneficial in resolving stage of pneumonia. A supported sitting position may help to extend the lungs and improve respiratory symptoms in children. So uh, these are the commonest general measures and non-pharmacological therapies that we would definitely ask uh, most most of our colleagues to do. And this is going to go a long way in terms of taking care of pneumonia in children. We got the kind of progress with the progress of the child. Yeah. So basically, uh, what we saw was initially the child had uh, started. I uh, uh, had. Uh, a non severe community acquired pneumonia where child has normal saturation but the child was already started on ceftriaxone and iv amikacin again uh, dr anup uh, would have told you that there is no reason for you to start iv ceftriaxone and iv amikacin and iv amikacin should never be used in a child who already has community acquired pneumonia there is no role of iv amikacin apart from that child has progressed to significant severe pneumonia or very severe pneumonia so with empyema because of which a uh, child has significant distress and hypoxemia so child was shifted to pico from our emergency room and started on hfnc with hfnc child stay, stay vitals were stabilized heart rates which were 120 160 170 came down to 120 respiratory rate of 66 to 70 to 42 saturation 100% in uh, with uh, hfnc and bp was normal so here because child was already on iv ceftriaxone so child was started on iv piperacillin tazobactam and clindamycin clindamycin was started with a reason because this is a very fast progressing pneumonia from a, a non severe community acquired pneumonia to a very severe community acquired pneumonia with complications so chances of pneumolysin toxin being produced significantly was considered and child was started on clindamycin after stabilization of this child a early wax was planned depending on what we had seen in our and a uh, ultrasound chest so wax was done on this particular child wax had 150 ml of turbid fluid aspirated from pool space sent for gram stain afb stain aerobic culture and afb culture and as well as decortication was done post op was shifted to picu icd in c2 mechanically ventilated for 2 days extubated on uh, post op day 3 to hfnc but continued to be febrile with air leak so uh, we already knew that this is what we are going to see uh, empyema that is going to persist but uh, we also did a, a chest x ray post wax 
And what I want you to appreciate here is, uh, so there is uh, no video, sir. Video is not playing. No, no, no. There's no time for the video. We <laughs> just okay, sure. So what we were able to see is, uh, apart from uh, uh, significant amount of pus, there was significant amount of uh, necrotic lesions on the uh, visceral pleura. So necrotic lesions with significant amount of, uh, so we already had a consideration of a necrotizing pneumonia in this particular child. So next slide, sir. So we, at this particular time, our diagnosis was very severe complicated community acquired pneumonia with empyema, status WATS, status post WATS and decortication, but continue to have persistent uh, fever spikes. But apparently after the pus was drained, General condition was reasonably better. What from what he was to what he was uh, day three, day four, he was reasonably looking better. He was uh, uh, phased out from HFNC to uh, oxygen with uh, nasal prongs. Appetite was reasonably better. Cultures uh, no growth. Plural fluid uh, for uh, plural fluid for genotype was sent, and it came back as Streptococcus pneumonia 19A. And uh, because we knew that we were dealing here with the uh, severe acquired community acquired pneumonia with a few necrotizing lesions on the visceral parenchyma. So we continued with the same antibiotic. So, uh, Dr. Jagdish, what are the clues to complications in a uh, or non or difficult to control or resolve pneumonia in a community acquired pneumonia? Thank you, Dr. Jason, and I think uh, Dr. Shrikanta has brought out uh, some of the uh, very important things that you will when you will suspect a complicated pneumonia the first thing is we have basically three situations that we need to keep in mind when we are looking at a child who's likely to go in for a complicated pneumonia the first most important thing is the age of the child the younger the child is the child is more likely to get into complication it's very common for a small infant who lands up with pneumonia who progresses can land up with a problem the other things that we need to look at is preterm graduates. So these are these are children who can land up again because of various reasons. The first reason is that many of them do not have optimal immune function. The second is many of them are ventilated and would have probably some degree of damage to the tracheobronchial tree. And it's very easy for these children to land up with complications. In addition to that, we all know that children who have got with congenital heart disease can also land up with significant, uh, uh, significantly complicated pneumonia. Pre-existing pulmonary disease like chronic lung disease are other candidates who can land up with problem. Congenital malformations can get infected and land up with complicated pneumonia. We all know that severe malnutrition is a major problem in our country and these children also can land up with severe uh, pneumonia. Post measles situation is another condition in our country where you can land up with problems. We also have seen in recent past, of course, not so much in children, but in uh, with the COVID complication with pneumonia is another factor which leads to morbidity and mortality. Another way of looking at it is uh, the persistent poor response to treatment variety, where the child you start with appropriate antibiotic but does not respond and progresses fairly rapidly. These are again children who can land up with a severe complication. And finally, very important as Dr. Uh, uh, Srikanta showed you there, 19A, there are certain bugs which have a tendency for producing progression and necrosis. Dr. Warrior mentioned about the PVL strain of Staphylococcus. So this is one which produces toxin which allows the bacteria to necrose and progress through the lung. So we have basically three, type 3, 19A, which are particularly bad bugs to get because one, they are resistant to antibiotics. They are, they are not very well protected by the vaccines they have that we have. And finally, they have the propensity to cause pulmonary destruction, empyema and necrosis. So therefore, these are the situations where one would look at a problem with uh, a child who's got pneumonia. But Anup, uh, can you now, would you want to change the antibiotic regimen with this, when these new complications develop? Good evening all. Uh, coming back to the antibiotic part of it, as uh, reiterating again the first slide of my <coughs> presentation, now presence of complications do not take away the fact that this is a strep pneumonia infection and hence 
persistent fever other host reactions etc is not a prime indication for antibiotic change in this what was primarily it was done and which improved the child were other interventions in tackling the complications so if you look at the profile of complicated cap in children the most common organisms which results in complications are again strep pneumonia which was proven in this child staph aureus strep pyogenes and in southeast asia the publications also list tuberculosis less common organisms are anaerobes it is possible that co infections are present along with strep and an anaerobes anaerobes sometimes klebsiella rarely it usually is picked up very well in cultures and mycoplasma we have already discussed in detail in the previous section the duration of antibiotics change when we have complicated pneumonia we require 2 to 3 weeks of antibiotics you need to give iv at least until the child is febrile for 3 days and then takes orally well and we can follow it up with oral antibiotics to complete between 4 to 6 weeks invasive drainage of collections to be considered early if the child is sick or responding poorly to antibiotics otherwise it is possible to observe for about a week whether we want to go on to invasive drainage and surgical options a note here about the fluid flu uh, plural, plural fluid culture the plural fluid is positive only in 56% of the cases in one of the large series which was published this last year and as mentioned earlier it is possible that it is polymicrobial it was just about 13% it was polymicrobial please remember a good practice that if you are doing plural culture directly inoculate the plural fluid into a blood culture bottle one aerobic and one anaerobic which will give you the best pickup to summarize initiate empiric therapy for classical pathogens and amoxicillin at regular dose does the job no benefit of routine coverage for mycoplasma with macrolide a large amount of data from the who evidence review prsp is rare in india just about 10% and even if there is penicillin resistance no direct impact on clinical outcome and hence amox at regular dose does its job as empiric antibiotic therapy prsp is a not enzyme mediated resistance no benefit with clavulinate duration of 5 days in uncomplicated and up to 3 weeks for staph aureus investigate for unusual pathogens including mtb and mildosis when you have exposure history or atypical findings or when you have clinical failure on regular antibiotics and no local complications clinical failure is much more likely from a local complications like empyema or an effusion rather than a failing antibiotic and that's why imaging and analysis of pleural fluid and where required surgical interventions are important appropriate duration for a complicated pneumonia is 2 to 6 weeks and as a last take back message start by analyzing the risk factors for unusual pathogens we have discussed the list of antibiotics which are used for unusual pathogens you would require pcrs and serology in this particular child you see how a pcr confirmed that this was strep pneumonia even though it was quite complicated based on this you can have targeted therapy antimicrobial resistance can be considered like prsp mrsc and macrolide resistant mycoplasma and all these require modification of the empiric therapy as we discussed in the previous slides and consider invasive drainage in complications not responding to medical management within a reasonable duration instead of switching adding and changing antibiotics thank you thank you again anu dr sikanda how did this child's lung fare and what is the possible effects of severe pneumonia in long term lung function What are the ventilatory supports, procedures, and surgical interventions that are needed to be considered? Right. So basically, when our uh, surgeon went inside, so he had already seen a significant amount of uh, necrosis on the visceral uh, pleural surfaces, uh, and he had told us that uh, there is a chance that this child is going to develop necrotizing pneumonia. So this is on day five. So a child which had a very very uh, nice uh, shadow on chest x ray has become completely necrosed so what you can see is there are significant amount of uh, air opacities inside the lung parenchyma which is uh, very very characteristic of necrotizing pneumonia apart from that this is a, a ct uh, video uh, apparently video is not playing but you can see there is significant amount of uh, uh, air pockets inside the lung parenchyma again suggestive of uh, necrotizing pneumonia 
So at this time, the diagnosis of very severe complicated community acquired pneumonia with empyema, status, uh, status post VATS and decortication had developed necrotizing pneumonia with persistent air leak. So a persistent air leak is an air leak that goes beyond uh, seven days and it usually goes beyond 14 days. So anything more than two weeks is already called as a persistent air leak. And in this boy, it was a persistent air leak. So on day seven post VATS, no fever spikes, child was completely better able to maintain saturations in room air, but continue to have persistent air leaks. So from here, he was shifted to wards and continued with same antibiotics. So because he was doing so well and uh, continued to improve with respect to general condition, but because of persistent uh, per persistence of BPF, he was, uh, it was, the decision was made to treat conservatively with a hemlic valve and sent home on oral amoxicillin clavulinate and linozolid and asked to review after two weeks. So after two weeks, so the, the, there was no air leak. We clamped the tube for four hours and there was no recollection of air. General condition was good. Child had gained weight and had no significant respiratory symptoms. So chest tube was removed and he was vaccinated with PCV13 and you could see the chest x-ray. So the, there was significant improvement in his chest x-rays. So what are the normal uh, ventilatory support that we use? So we have multiple modalities. We have HFNCs, we have CPAPs, and BiPAPs. And in this particular child, he was intubated and ventilated only because he required a, 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 a VATS procedure rather than anything else. Apart from that, what are the procedures or surgeries that we do in this? So bedside procedures are needle pleurosynthesis. That is for uh, normal... Uh, for any child who comes with uh, pleural effusions, exudative pleural effusions, or we also do tube pleurosynthesis. Apart from tube pleurosynthesis, we also do uh, 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 insert the, the we also put in uh, urokinase or streptokinase as uh, uh, therapy. Apart from that, surgery is done. So the other thing is. Uh, I think uh, the forgotten art that is putting a chest tube because everybody is doing in, going into early VATS now. So insertion of chest tube, the site is selected in the metaxillary line in the fifth intercostal space on the superior aspect of the sixth rib in the safe triangle. Ultrasound or sonographically guided insertion found to be effective. May seek help from pediatric surgeon. Now, uh, because of uh, the Seldinger's technique, it has become much more easier to insert one. And uh, post tube uh, thoracostomy care, keep the system patent, keep the system airtight, maintain sterility of the system to avoid introduce, introducing bacteria into pleural space. Drain should be clamped for at least one, uh, one hour once 10 ml per kg are initially removed. That is to uh, have no problems with negative air pressure, pulmonary edema, and dependent drainage is something that is used all the time. Patient should perform as much activity as can tolerate it. Encourage the facilitation of deep breathing and airway clearances. Again, something that I've already spoken about, no physiotherapy. Use analgesics on an individual basis to facilitate airway clearance. And when to remove, timing of uh, elective removal is a clinical decision. So amount of fluid draining. So usually amount of fluid that we consider is not more than three to five ml per kg. No bubbling, child's temperature, if the child is continuously, continuously spiking temperatures, please do not remove chest tubes. It can cause significant recollection again. General well-being, do we really require a chest X-ray and ultrasound appearance? So to remove a chest tube, we don't require an, a, a chest X-ray, but uh, ultrasound appearance is going to give you, if there is significant recollection with significant amount of uh, uh, loculations, then definitely a VATS will definitely be helpful. Fall in acute phase reactance is definitely something is uh, something that we do look for. It is not necessary to wait for complete cessation of drainage, except small drainages like up to 30 to 50 ml per day. Like I've already told you, 3 to 5 ml per kg is that is acceptable, but there should not be any air leak uh, to do that. What is the role of fibrinolytics, streptokinase, urokinase, altiplase? So normally that is used in uh, most of the setups are streptokinase or urokinase. Recommended by some for a shorter stay in hospital, particularly in complicated paranemonic effusions. So in units which do not have uh, access to pediatric surgeons or interventional pulmonologists, something that can be used. No evidence that any of the three is more effective. Mainly in UK studied in a randomized controlled trial in children. So is recommended only by BTS. UK, we give 40,000 international unit of uh, urokinase in 40 ml of NS for more than 10 kilos or 10 unit, uh, 10,000 units. So it is given twice a day for three days and uh, the indwelling time is for around four hours. And uh, what are the usual complications? So hemorrhage, fever, pleural, play, pleural pain, arthralgias, headaches, 
hypoxemic respiratory failure, anaphylaxis, antigenic response, particularly with streptokinase, and most importantly, there can be significant amount of additions. So that will lead to significantly difficult patch. But again, uh, something that can be tried in setups which do not have a pediatric surgeon access. So when do we do surgery? Failure of treatment and collection of fluid for more than 10 days. But currently, the guideline says early wax is something that is indicated. So again, two, uh, uh, two, uh, uh, two theories. One is the UK theory. The other one is US theory. US theory goes with early wax, whereas UK theory goes with first fibrolytics and then only go for wax. Modalities... Currently, we have uh, given up doing open thoracotomy and debridement, mini thoracotomy and debridement. It's only VATS now, and VATS has shown to have significant. So in VATS, primary or secondary, primary VATS is the patient presents late, uh, secondary VATS when the standard therapy fails. Advantages, early recovery and resolution of empyema comparable to open decortication. A viable solution decreases the stay, but not easily available and not as cheap. Long-term outcomes, conservative treatment, so decortication, ICT drain, no difference on long-term outcome. Pleural thickening has a benign course and capacity to resolve better in children due to inherent elasticity of both thoracic cage and lung tissue. That is something that everybody has to consider. Patient tested had normal lung function, that is 80 to 100% of predicted. Surgery, uh, we already have discussed. So, uh, take home messages. Uh, so the most consistent clinical sign of pneumonia, less than two months. So respiratory rate, respiratory rate, respiratory rate. So please measure your respiratory rate for one minute. So this has been that is something that has been told multiple times from RTI gems to everywhere. A respiratory rate for one minute is gold standard in diagnosing pneumonias, particularly in children. A tachypnea sensitive and specific tool, 66% approximate as good or better than auscultation for pneumonias. But there are several clinical situations which has already been uh, spoken about. Do all patients require chest radiography? No, not all CAPs, particularly in community setting. Yes, when you are suspecting complications or a rapid progression, or there is ambiguous clinical features. Microbiological, not recommended routinely. Takes a long time, hence has limited utility. This is purely for non-severe community-acquired pneumonias. Sputum culture, cop swaps has relatively poor reliability. Invasive methods cannot be justified for routine pneumonias. And the role of pulse oximetry, acute phase reactants, etc. It's already been spoken about, so I'm not going to go too much into it. Defining community-acquired pneumonia. Again, uh, there is no uh, definition. What it excludes is, so basically we have to look at children with immunodeficiency. And if there are children with immunodeficiencies, so it can be primary or a secondary severe malnutrition post measles state, you have to start looking at the complications, ventilator associated pneumonia, nosocomial spread or recurrent, which one. So reliability of predicting uh, special etiological agents based on clinical features and or radiology, generally poor, which we already have discussed. Exception is staph aureus. When do you suspect staph aureus? That also has been spoken about, very rapid progression. Skin lesions, infected scabies, or skin lesions because of measles, uh, 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 pneumothorax, a pleural effusion, or rapidly progressive uh, empyema. And antibiotics wise, amoxicillin, 40 mg per kg per day for five days is more than enough in non severe community acquired pneumonia. Thank you. Thank you so much for all, for all uh, participants. Now, the questions in the chat box. Uh, access watch reserve, uh, which altogether forms the aware pro categorization of microbial, microbial WHO. Uh, what does this mean? Think Dr. Shiv Prasad has asked. Dr. Anupadir, can you answer that? Can you repeat it, Dr. Jordan? Jason, I couldn't hear you. The, you had those three categories of access, uh, watch, access aware reserve. and uh, restricted. Yes, aware. Yeah, group, that yeah. is called aware group. Yeah, aware group. Yeah, so the, uh, the access is uh, the common uh, antibiotics like doxycycline and amox, which has to be present and available for both outpatient and early inpatient care for the routine infections which we see in the community. The aware group is the, that kind of that batch of antibiotics which have got resistance potential, which includes quinolones and which also in fact includes macrolides because azithromycin is not an access. It's actually an aware and a separate group which has high 
uh, what do you call it? it has got a uh, risk of stimulating or uh, resulting in resistance in other group of bacteria also like quinolones can increase mrsa okay so that's why they are under that group called aware and restricted is obviously the last line of resistance for us used to treat extremely drug resistant bacteria so it includes carbapenem stegocycline colistin and that grade of antibiotics uh he's also asked why not give cp i was not considered obviously is, uh, yes crystalline penicillin is an extremely effective against strep pneumonia and in this case unfortunately we don't know about the penicillin mic's or resistance we have just the pcr but in a proven penicillin sensitive streptococci why not definitely crystalline penicillin is a good choice dr uh, ramurthy palanaman from uh, uh, chennai from tamil nadu he is asked can peptas be considered as for in severe infections above the diaphragm usually it's below the diaphragm cons considering uh, esp organisms and anaerobes uh, is peptas okay for uh, uh, st uh, that for or strep pneumonia so in terms of its coverage peptas is extremely broad so definitely it gives adequate cover for strep pneumonia but the question is do you need peptas for strep pneumonia you are not going to undercover or miss strep pneumonia with peptas peprazolin are extended amino penicillins they have extremely or uridyl penicillin in this case have got extremely good coverage for strep pneumonia so very effective but the reason is do you really need it yeah dr jagdish there's a question uh, what is the possibility of uh, uh, missing out on a severe pneumonia if you just look at tachypnea well the uh, it depends on the host basically the uh, if the child gets exhausted then pneumonia can progress and the respiratory rate may even come down so the important thing is that while in an active child in a healthy child a respiratory rate is a very good indicator of pneumonia there is no correlation between the number of breaths the child takes and the severity of pneumonia it's just an elevation in the work of breathing so there is no direct correlation it also in occasional cases you can have severe pneumonia with a drop in the respiratory rate primarily because the child is exhausted so especially when you are looking at very severe pneumonias you can have a drop in the rate the next question is is uh, a severe pneumonia could it be associated with congenital cardiac failure beg your pardon is the congenital uh, uh, left heart failure yeah i mean it's with, uh, very very uh, far fetched but toxin mediated could be possible the other possibility is that if there is a spread to the uh, pericardium there could be a possibility but directly there is no correlation between pneumonia and cardiac failure and the question is uh, clindamycin uh, resistance you said is uh, that macrolide uh, induced resistance to clindamycin how long does it take for the in in clinical facts for to develop i mean for a child who's toxic even if the clindamycin resistance is shown on the automated uh, uh, cultures or your disc you have asked for a detest is it okay to give clindamycin for the first 3 days to take care of the toxin because it takes a few days for the macrolide resistance to develop in that particular case is that uh, is, is there any evidence for the time required for macrolide resistance to develop in a particular case i will hand that over to dr varier yeah. so the usual timeline of inducible resistance is between 3 to 5 days so the first 48 hours when you are not sure of the susceptibility or even you have got the report but it is the first couple of days which you are using it it still would work so it would it take 3 to 5 days for the inducible resistance to come and clindamycin to fail but you should remember that in staph pneumonia the treatment duration is long 2 to 3 weeks and that is the reason why we advise looking at this to decide whether you want to continue further no but the toxin would be released so the first few days the no no toxin the, the the toxin production is inhibited by its anti ribosomal activity so yeah. if it is resistant it will not inhibit toxin production because the activity how it reduces toxin production is by attacking the ribosome and if there is resistance which is that means this anti ribosomal activity is nullified it will not Uh, negate the activity of toxin it has no role if it is resistant even for the, even for the first few days if you give it for for toxin uh, uh, for 
uh, inhibiting the tox toxicity. If, if clinda is resistant, do not use it at all. Go for linazolid. If clinda is sensitive, and even if D test is positive, you can give clinda for first few days because inducible resistance takes time. Yeah. That's a uh, that's a point that uh, you know often you don't use clindamycin at all. Sometimes it might uh, have a role play. Uh, Doctor Srikanta, what is the role of uh, ultrasound? You know, you you said ultrasound is useful. You we're using more and more of ultrasound in diagnosis of uh, pneumonia and its complications. What is the is it better than CT or is is ultrasound uh, the the gold standard? So basically, when we are looking at uh... Uh, pneumonia. So there are multiple studies now to diagnose pneumonia with ultrasounds rather than using the chest X-ray, and uh, finding air bronchograms from ultra by ultrasound is as good as doing a chest X-ray. One. Second thing is again you need to have expertise. You need to have an ultrasound machine, which is definitely more expensive to have. The second thing is usage of ultrasound in diagnosis of pleural effusions. Definitely, it is far more superior. Rather than doing a CT, it's a bedside procedure. It, uh, it probably it is available in most of the hospitals. And follow up of those patients from just developing a exudative pleural effusion to empyema is something that is very very important. Apart from that. If the empyema has been drained, the same ultrasound machine can be utilized to look for necrosis inside. The only problem with ultrasound is because there are so many uh, artifacts in between the ultrasound probe and the lung parenchyma with air coming in between, the images look reasonably smaller. And because of it, sometimes you might not be able to see the deeper structures so reasonably well. So apart from that, ultrasound is as good as any other modality and when you are able to diagnose a few things from ultrasound there is no reason for you to go to ct thorax what are the probes i mean for pretty small children there are different probes and how do you keep this probe where do you keep this probe what is the best place to keep the probes when you are you doing ultrasound so basically there are multiple probes that are used so depending on the age we have uh, different types of probes but again the area which is affected that is the area that we keep our probes so imagine you have your right upper lobe pneumonia. I'm not going to go and keep it in the uh, interscapular, infrascapular area. I'm going to keep it in my in the in uh, infrascap infra infraclavicular area. So infraclavicular area will give us an evidence of uh, consolidation, the air bronchograms, as well as any fluid inside and necrotizing pneumonia. The, the only question that probably the person wants to ask is where do you keep it in pleural effusions? Definitely, definitely more dependent. So uh, if imagine pleural effusion is quite significant and it is involving uh, uh, the right lower lobe. So putting it in the right inter and infrascapular area will be a bit more uh, beneficial. And if you are planning for a pleurodesis, uh, sorry, uh, a pleurocentesis, then definitely in the, the safe triangle that is a fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line is reasonably good enough. Now, does the consolidation have to reach the pleura for the ultrasound pickup consolidation? Pardon, sir? Does the consolidation have to reach the pleura for you to pick up consolidation with the ultrasound? Absolutely no, absolutely no. You don't require, the only thing is you will have artifacts. So imagine there are only two subsegments of the right upper lobe that has infected and the other subsegment is aerated. Then the chances of you uh, having a little bit of air, uh, artifacts because of the air is slightly on the higher side, but you will pick up uh, consolidation. Uh, Jagdish, do you do repeat chest x-rays uh, on follow-up? Uh, no, we don't. Unless unless there is a suspected complication, no, we don't do a routine chest X-ray because chest X-ray normalization can take months after an episode of pneumonia. And a radiological abnormality does not mean that there is persistence of disease. While I'm at this, I would just come in with Dr. Srikanta's point and that is to diagnose, to diagnose necrotizing pneumonia ultrasound is inferior to CT chest. So it, if you want to establish uh, necrotizing pneumonia, contrast enhanced CT is the way forward because an ultrasound may not be always 100% sure in terms of delineating the necrosis. Last question is, uh, is there uh, any role for zinc? That is, Ginny has asked, uh, zinc. In, in patients who are zinc deficient, zinc may be useful to improve immunity especially if you're going to give it along with vitamin a, vitamin a uh, for respiratory pathogens otherwise there is no direct effect of zinc on anything 
Okay, so we go on to the quiz now because I think we are uh, we have had enough questions and there are, there will be many more. Uh, oh my God. I totally agree with Jagdish sir. CT thorax has better delineation of uh, necrotizing pneumonia. But if somebody is good enough in uh, doing an ultrasound thorax, particularly some people uh, swear by ultrasound thorax, for them, even picking up uh, necrotizing pneumonias is reasonably uh, good in terms of uh, just doing ultrasound. But definitely, CT thorax is the diagnostic choice of modality in not only diagnosing uh, necrotizing pneumonias, but also diagnosing uh, empyema, which is complicated. Thank you. So yeah, we go to the quiz. Let's see if there are any PGs around. I don't know if there are PGs set this late. We will start with question one. Pneumocal resistance to beta lactams can be overcome by increasing beta lactam doses, except for sinusitis, meningitis, bacteremia, pneumonia. All are true about uh, com committed wet pneumonia in children in India, except CAP is a leading cause of mortality in under five in developing countries, including India. It's bit cutoffs less than two months, more than 60, two to 11 months, more than 50, 12, 59 months, more than 40. Severe pneumonia and CAP is the presence of danger signs. Fast breathing without chest and drawing does not get classified as pneumonia. Cap with any danger sign is classified as severe pneumonia. All are true regarding findings in respiratory system in cap, except wheezing is more likely to be present when probable etiology of cap is viral rather than bacterial. Classical findings of crepitations may be present in only 26 to 30 percent of WHO defined pneumonia. The presence of wheeze rules out bacterial etiology of CAP. Typical clinical findings of pneumonia may be absent in, in infants below the age of two months. Older children and adolescents are more likely to have findings as rails, dullness, percussion, bronchial breath sounds, tactile primitus, and oral drug. All are true regarding the etiology of CAP in children except gram negative enteric pathogens are the most common cause in units. Most common viral etiology of CAP are RSV and adenovirus. Chub pneumonia is the most common cause in children between two months and five years of age. Majority of children with CAP have multiple pathogens, bacteria, and viruses. Etiology predominates in preschoolers. All are true regarding investigations for CAP, except the role of blood culture is limited even in severe CAP admitted to intensive care or with complications as the yield is poor. Test X ray is not required for the diagnosis of CAP. Ball and culture may be useful to decide on etiology and make rapid decisions. Use of multiplex PCRs has revealed high rates of bacterial and viral and co-infection, signaling with which is the source of ongoing investigation. Serological testing of in pneumonia performed 14 days apart is a gold standard for hypoplasma pneumonia detection. All are true regarding amoxicillin except it's an excellent spectrum penicillin. Compared to penicillin G, penicillin B has greater activity against endocrocci, hysteria, gram negatives like H influence and E. coli. Cell wall protein moiety alteration confers resistance by facilitating the acquisition and stabilization of the MEC A gene. It could be used as first line drug for uncomplicated streptococcal sore throat if methyl penicillin is not available. Doubling the dose of amoxicillin overcomes resistance due to alteration of cell wall 
protein moiety. All are true about community acquired pneumonia uh, that is uh, by MRSA, that's community acquired MRSA, except the foxitin disc sensitivity is old standard for diagnosis of MRSA. Community acquired MRSA produces MBL toxin, which produce, causes necrotizing pneumonia. Community acquired MRSA are susceptible only to glycopeptides and linozolic. Most community acquired strains carry uh, SCC, MEC type 4 and 5. Risk factors for community acquired MRSA include skin trauma, infections, crowding, frequent skin to skin contact, sharing potentially contaminated personal items or equipment, and frequent exposure to antimicrobial agents. All are true about ultrasound chest in, in community acquired pneumonia, except consolidation to reach the pleura for it to be seen with ultrasound. Size of pneumonia appears larger at ultrasound than on radiographs. Consolidation, consolidated laying is similar in a constitutive liver and spleen. Total effusion is classically oh. echo free. Lung abscess appears in ultrasound sets hypoechoic lesions with well defined or irregular wall and an echoic center, sometimes with internal echoes and separation. Long-term effects of severe pneumonia in childhood include all except restrictive and obstructive lung function deficits, increased risk of adult asthma, increased risk of recurrent pneumonia, increased risk of non-smoking related COPD, and increased risk of bronchial cases. The last one is all the following are drainage options for para pneumonic effusions, except small uncomplicated para infusions should not be routinely drained and then treated with antibiotic therapy alone. Tube thoracostomy with or without insulation of fibrolytics can be performed successfully in a large number of children. Bad seismicity is the best method because of decreased length of stay. Timing of fibrolytic insulation immediate versus later significantly affects outcome. Ultrasound characterization of fluid and perhaps glucose levels may guide surgical versus non-surgical therapy. Reason, sir, I don't think so. We have any postgraduates answering. It's all uh, in your consultants. Okay, we'll give it to them. You see. <laughs> you, you check that out, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, uh, we'll uh, discuss the answers uh, i invite uh, uh, the faculty to go. the first question of course is to Tanu can start pneumococcal resistance to beta lactam can be overcome by increasing beta lactam doses except for so uh, the prime answer is meningitis where the MICs are required to overcome are very, very low. The drug levels reached in the brain are much less compared to lung. So the answer is meningitis. And uh, obviously the options are vanco and quinolones and even high dose meropenem in this category. Dr. Jagdish. All are true about CAP in children in India, except the correct answer is D. Fast breathing without chest in drawing does not get classified as pneumonia is a wrong uh, sentence because the, one of the definitions for pneumonia is fast breathing with chest in drawing. The fast breathing along with this. Thing. Number three, the correct answer is C. The presence of bees does not rule out bacterial etiology of CAP as we have seen in the um, presentation. The correct answer for four would be E. Bacterial etiology does not predominate in preschoolers. It is predominantly the viral etiology that is seen in uh, preschoolers.
um, all are true regarding the um, investigations yeah so this is as far as investigation is concerned the role of blood culture is limited even in severe cip admitted intensive care that is the correct answer as the complications and yield is pretty poor Uh, Dr. Anup, all are true regarding amoxicillin, except so it's an extended spectrum penicillin. The, so that's true. Compared to penicillin, it has greater activity against enterococcal, listeria, and gram negatives like H. influenzae. That is also true. Cell wall protein alteration confirms resistance by facilitating macagene. That's false because macagene is associated with Staph aureus MRSA. Used as first line for uncomplicated strep if penicillin is not available. That is also true. Doubling the dose of amoxicillin, that is high dose, 90 milligram per kg, overcomes the cell wall alteration. That is also true. So answer is the MECA, which is for staph aureus and not for amoxicillin. And what is the uh, it's PBB2A? The penicillin binding protein. So the beta lactam resistance in strep is through altered penicillin binding protein, which the amoxicillin or higher dose amoxicillin can overcome. All are true about community acquired MRSA except uh, cefoxetine disc sensitivity. This we have reiterated that that is a gold standard for diagnosing MRSA. So that is true. CA MRSA produces PVL toxin causing necrotizing pneumonia. That is also true. Community acquired pneumonia susceptible only to glycopeptides and linozolate. That is false. We have seen clindamycin susceptibility, erythromycin susceptibility, septran or tortrimosol susceptibility, tetracycline susceptibility. So that is false. Most CMRs carry MECA 4 5, that is true, and risk factors like skin trauma, and this thing is also true. So let me take over a few. Yeah. So, all are true about uh, ultrasound chest in uh, CAP, which I've already discussed. Uh, so, size of pneumonia appears larger at ultrasound than on radiograph, that is false. In general, the size of pneumonia appears smaller at ultrasound than on radiographs. This is because the periphery of the pneumonia is more air filled which results in more artifacts, which I've already spoken about, thus limiting the complete visualization of the consolidation. Long-term effects of severe pneumonia in childhood include all except, uh, so basically increased risk of recurrent pneumonia is something that is not there until unless there is underlying uh, immunodeficiency or uh, uh, foreign body which is left out, th the chances of increased risk of recurrent pneumonia is not there. But the others long time side effects have been looked into and they have been found to have a certain amount of uh, restrictive or obstructive lung deficits. But again, we have to make sure these children are followed up in the long term trials. So as to ascertain, definitely these are uh, there to stay. Apart from that, uh, all of the following are drainage options for paranemonic effusions, except so uh, of all the options, I think uh, everybody knows the timing of fibrinolytic installation. It is uh, either immediate or later, 48 hours after chest tube insertion, does not, not significantly affect much of it, that is length of stay, hospital uh, ch ch charges, or tendency to need surgery eventually in children with empyema who received interfluoral fibrinolytics. So basically, uh, Everything else is true except for intervention of fibrinolytics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Pramod. Can you say who the winner is? Well, there were not many answers and only uh, only five of them were correct. My gosh, that's not very great. So I think uh, we'll have to skip the. I think so. That's that's. Uh, I thought community acquired pneumonia would have more correct answers, but this time uh, the answers have been very few and far between. Anyway, uh, the second time you said the complications are. Uh, do are these studies? Do they have um, uh, idea of what the pre pneumonia lung status is? You know, that's that's a problem that has been said when these long term complications of pneumonia, severe pneumonia. We don't know. Uh, the most of these studies don't.